Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Playing It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Today, I want to share with you a conversation I had with Oliver Berkman. You may be familiar with his work because of his column in The Guardian and his books. He wrote the books Help, How to Become Slightly Happier and Get a Bit More Done. His second book is called The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. And his latest book is 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. Oliver is a journalist by training. He has been shortlisted for the Orwell Prize in 2006. He won the Foreign Press Association's Young Journalist of the Year. And he also won the FPA Science Story of the Year for a piece on the mystery of consciousness. I have been reading Oliver's work for years. He's one of my favorite writers. I absolutely love how he talks about science, behavioral science, affective science in a way that is accessible and relatable to all of us. And over the years, he also has been making sassy comments about different concepts and ideas in psychology. And in this conversation, you will hear me asking him about some of the sassy comments he has made. I think my conversation with Oliver naturally unfolded into three different areas. In the first part of the conversation, I learned a lot about Oliver's writing process, how he comes up with an outline, how he chooses the topics and ideas he's going to write about how he handles the urges of keep going when he has some flow on his writing, how he relates to comparison thoughts when writing. In the second part of the conversation, we talk about his last two books, The Antidote and 4,000 Weeks, and we touch base on the key ideas of each one of the books, how the way that we think of happiness and pursue happiness is wrong and how being alive is something to be grateful for. We also talk about how Oliver practices acceptance and gratitude in his day-to-day life. And in the last part of the conversation, I do a little bit of rapid firing questions and I ask Oliver his thoughts on different controversial opinions he has made over the years, like what is an emotion, the difference between meaning and happiness, what's wrong with self-help books. I can tell you that this was a very special conversation. I hope you find it useful. And if you want to read something that gives you a new perspective on life and how you relate to thinking, to happiness, you definitely have to read Oliver's books. I highly, highly recommend them. You have written books. You have your newsletter, The Imperfectionist. You have the column in The Guardian. What's your writing process, if I can ask? If we can look behind the scenes, how do you choose a topic? How do you research about the topic? Well, it's very kind of you to say I've written books. I have written two books and then a third book, which was a collection of columns. So I don't feel like I write them very fast. They take me quite a long time. (laughs) <laughs> but um, uh, what's my writing uh, process? I guess that I, I trained as a journalist. Mm-hmm. So I trained writing for newspapers. Um, for me, 
it's very important to break down these big projects into small projects mm -hmm. and and so there's something about the kind of um i don't know 800 word chunk which is very sort of it's how i've been trained so you know i i know how to write a column i know how to write a news story and then often when i'm trying to write something bigger it's partly just a question of seeing how i can break it down into those smaller pieces you still want to make sure that it hangs together as a as an organic whole right it shouldn't mm -hmm. just be a list of short columns but um so that's that that's really the key to it for me is sort of makes it much less intimidating it means you can really focus you can do one of those little pieces in like a day's work or something mm -hmm. where and so um you know this is a cliche really this idea about breaking it down into small chunks but it but it really it really works for me so that's one thing I could say other things but you, I don't know if you have specific questions or I do have one question um and I think you wrote about it a little bit in one of your newsletters when we are writing and we have the writing juices kicking in it's natural that we want to write more and more and it's mm. natural that we may want to write like three hours how do you do that do you write in huge chunks of time do you write in a small amounts of time and how do you manage to pause this is a great question this is something that i've definitely it's been a discovery for me mm. um it has an obvious part and a less obvious part i think and the obvious part is yes it's very effective to write in in smaller uh periods of time for me anyway than to binge to write for many many hours you have to find the sweet spot because you do want to get into focus and into concentration mm -hmm. um but you don't want to uh but it's still important to keep it very sort of uh like not a big deal you know mm -hmm. so like the right so this comes partly from a psychologist called robert boyce who i've, I've written about his work but he mm -hmm. the idea here is to say like you know as a professional writer maybe i will try to spend three or four hours of my day really actually writing if someone is not a professional writer maybe they only want to spend half an hour of their day writing but you probably never want to spend like nine hours of your day writing, even if you have that possibility, because mm -hmm. it's sort of, it, it turns it into this very, very big deal. It makes it into this kind of um, thing that dominates your life. And Boyce's very sensible insight was to say that, you know, if you keep it sort of like a modest part of your life, Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to come back to it day after day after day because it's just one of the things that you do. You don't feel imprisoned and oppressed by it. Mm -hmm. But the the less obvious part of this, which has made a big difference to me, which he said as well, is that you know, um, whatever time you decide, if it's two hours or one hour or whatever, when that time is up, you should stop, like you say, right? You should walk away from it, even if you feel like you're on a roll, it's all going well, because again you want to sort of the idea in yourself that you want to reinforce is not oh my goodness i have to seize this motivation because i might never have it again i've got to get to the end that the the part the idea in yourself that you want to reinforce is like i can leave this it's going to be fine i can come back tomorrow and do a bit more then and it'll still be fine and you know not everyone there are people who write successfully in binges i think but for me that's been a really huge insight to be like oh i'll actually get more done mm -hmm. if i re regularly step away and plus it makes it kind of exciting to return to it the next day right and that's crucial because um you know you need that sort of pull that that draw to um to want to carry on so yeah that's 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 where that comes in yeah that makes a huge difference but it's hard right because sometimes we have this strong urge. So you yeah. coach yourself, do you say, okay, so Oliver, just let it go, move on with the rest of your day? Yeah, I mean, I'm not always successful. Sometimes I will just plow on and maybe sometimes that's okay, but but no, what I tend to try to do is, the only thing that works for me is, is physical, right? So it's almost like I, I like make myself get up, walk away <laughs> from my desk, go outside, you know, 
and all the time I'll be my head will still be in the writing but I can sort mm -hmm. of make my body move away and then sometimes at least my brain catches up and once I've got outside or drunk a glass of water or something like that gradually then my mind will like come to the present moment instead <laughs> of still being stuck on the last project yeah got it let me ask you a little bit more when you are writing and sometimes the mind comes with thoughts that is not good enough that you don't have a clear idea or start criticizing your writing how do right. you handle that this is a big struggle for me because i've always been very bad at that idea of like um just do a draft and it doesn't matter how bad it is and then you can make it better that's great advice but I'm always thinking, personally, I'm always thinking about the audience, you know, or right from the beginning, even when I should probably not be thinking about the audience. So, um, yeah, one, one thing to remember there, I can't remember who said this, but is that like, you, if you can, you should think to yourself that the, the only purpose of a first draft is to get to the second draft, right? That's the, the only thing you're doing for that first time is, is just sort of building a bridge, building one piece of a bridge to the next piece. So, you know, sometimes I will set a timer and do like, you know, 25 minutes of Pomodoro, uh, just like do whatever you can, race to do it, just to see how, what you can get down. And that sort of helps me detach from the outcome. And then mm -hmm. this is a bit more complicated of an idea, but I'm, I'm trying now in the way that I approach my ideas and my note taking and my reading to, I don't know if you've come across this idea, gets called different things, but like the idea of, uh, there's the idea of building a second brain. This comes from this guy, Tiago Forte. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's this idea of the Zettelkasten, the digit, the sort of the card index file, maybe. And all these things have the same basic idea that, you know, ideally, when you're reading things in life and you're thinking things or you're having conversations with your friends, things that come out of these processes should go into a central system so that you're never beginning with a completely blank page, right? You're never just saying like, oh my goodness, what should I write? Yeah. You're always just like, oh, what should I take out of my big, you know, stew of, of ideas? What should I, what should I focus on today? And I'm not that, I'm not, I'm still learning this, but I do find that really useful. So I have an, I do this in an app called Ulysses, but there are lots of different, there are lots of different pieces of software. It's not the important point. Um, and I just really try to keep a whole lot of ideas and notes from books and articles in there, sort of bubbling around. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully then the job is not to sort of, drag some new article out of the depths of my soul right it's just to <laughs> it's just to take another bit of this and polish it up a bit it yeah. does make sense it does make sense and i am familiar with that with the work of tiago i think that in the information era we we're exposed to so much yeah. and i relate to the idea of using databases of platforms as our second brain and yeah. um, i can ask a little bit more about this um, one of the things that I love in your writing is how you talk about science, whether that's behavioral science or social mm -hmm. science, and you share a story about that. I love the structure that you have in your writing. Sometimes you start with a story and then you build up scientific mm -hmm. references. You're putting the data out there, your experience and how you connect the dots. Um, and the closure, the, the last paragraph, it's really cool because you're not telling people what to think about things. So how do you organize that? How do you choose that personal story? How do you choose the researchers? Well, I suppose what I would say is, um, yeah, once I have sort of all my notes and thoughts and a whole big mess of stuff that I'm going to turn into a, a, a piece or a chapter mm -hmm. or something, that there is a very important phase where I'm probably going to be found wandering around in the park or on a hill or something with a piece of paper. And I'm trying to um, come up with the little, the little chunks, right? It's not, um, I'm not trying to come up with words at this point, but just as, for me, I think in sort of diagrams. So I'd be thinking about like, well, this moves into this, moves into this. 
And yeah, I think the normal structure is that you need an introduction. It doesn't have to be a personal anecdote, but you need an introduction. Okay. And then you need what you're trained in journalism to call a, a nut graph, where you, where you say, uh, you know, this is why you should be reading this and what we're going to mm -hmm. establish and what we're going to be considering. And then really it's just a question of after that sort of backing up that claim and giving evidence. And then, and then usually the sort of end is more of a kind of, or what I like to do with that sort of very last part is to sort of take that off in some quite speculative direction. So it's sort of like, <laughs> this is what we know about this idea, but like, if that's true, maybe this could be true as well, you know, and that makes it sound very formulaic, but I think that is probably basically what I'm usually doing. And I think it's, I think it's the one thing I do think about a lot is um, like in a column or in a, sec a subsection of a book chapter or whatever that sort of atomic unit is, mm -hmm. you should have like one really juicy point that you're trying to make. And, and sometimes when I can't write a chapter or a section or a column, mm -hmm. and I been, feels like I've been banging my head against the wall for a long time, I realize that it's because I didn't figure out what that one good mm -hmm. point is. So like, I, that's usually the problem. I, 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 I might be thinking like, oh, this is sort of an interesting topic but I haven't figured out the thing that I want to say about it. So that's, that's the discipline there. Yeah. God. So what will be a juicy point? If you think about the last book that you wrote, the 4,000 yeah. weeks, what will be yeah. a juicy point? Well, you made a lot of juicy points over the years in your career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like, so, so this book is divided into chapters, but then the chapters are divided into subsections. And I think that, um, I'm sure it's not perfect, but broadly speaking, each subsection has what I mean by a, um, juicy. a juicy point, right? <laughs> so um, let me try and find one that makes sense here. Um, so at a certain point in this book, when I've been through talking about busyness and all sorts of aspects of our struggles with time, I, I turn to this idea of like, planning for the future and trying to sort of control what happens in time mm -hmm. and and at one point in a chapter I just sort of unpack this idea that um we don't really have time you know that we don't really possess time in the way we think we do so that is not the whole point of the whole chapter the whole chapter is about lots of different things but that seems to me like a, a point that you need to sort of unpack and then sort of leave people thinking a bit differently. And sure, you know, some academic philosopher could probably write a whole book on that one idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like it's the right size. It's like a, it's a little brain explosion or something, but it's, but in about a thousand words, 800 words or something, you can sort of explain what you mean by that and give a couple of examples. Um, so that's, that's one of those. Um, uh, I'll try and pick one more. Hang on. I won't keep doing this. It'll get very boring very quickly. Um, it's not boring. I um, absolutely but, love it. <laughs> so in the introduction, for example, it, it's basically um, divided into, I think it's just three chunks, or is it four? No, it's three. So it's like life is human life is extremely short, and we feel that this is very painful. Then it is... Um, all our attempts to uh, have a better relationship with time seem to have the opposite effect. And then it is um, not only that we don't get any less busy, but that we seem to not even spend our time on the most meaningful things. So it's like time is a, time is a great burden. Our efforts to deal with it are counterproductive and they're counterproductive on this level of meaning, not just on the level of uh, free time. That's it. It's just three points. Once I have those, I can I can write the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So question for you about that. Um, do you find the juicy points while you are writing or do you need to have the juicy point before you start writing? What, what's the thinking process there? Just for curiosity, because in my experience, all your writing has a lot of juice, has a lot of spice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, that's a good question. I guess I... 
it comes in the middle, right? Because I'll sort of, I'll assemble all the material and my thoughts and I will sort of, right from the beginning, if I'm looking at a topic, I'll have like sort of a whole bunch of maybe not juicy points, just sort of thoughts about it, some of which might be good and some of which might not be. And I'll just sort of, I'll try to sort of organize what I've been reading and what I've been thinking into sort of clusters of stuff. And it's usually at that, it's not a very clear way of putting it. It's usually at, it's usually at that point that I can try to sort of see a juicy point, I guess. I guess what doesn't work, so I am, the writing process, Yeah. it's important to be involved in the writing process to find out what you think. I'm sure you know that, that experience. Yeah. But what I don't do, and, I, I, and some people I think do, but what I don't do is like literally start writing whole sentences and paragraphs without knowing where this section is going. Like I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> I, once or twice I have like in an, in an early draft of the antidote, um, I wrote like five, 6,000 words. I remember of a first chapter mm -hmm. and it, it was torture. It was terrible because I was just like, um, I, I just somehow thought that it, uh, these points were going to um, emerge mm -hmm. and they, they didn't. Um, okay. So I do need a little bit of, I am a bit of an outliner person okay. rather than a yeah okay so that was my other question what's your relationship with the outline uh you know people have different styles for some people once they have the outline that's it that's a skeleton and they follow the outline to the t what's your process no the outline it's really important that i do it but then i may well not follow it um ah. so and also sometimes it's not even like um let me find a piece of blank paper and say what I'm trying to express it. Sometimes it's not even going to be like a, a, a text outline, right? It could be very often the piece of paper that I'll be walking around with yeah. um, will be like, it'll, it'll look like it's something like this, right? Okay. It'll just be, okay. hang on, the camera's all bl blurry. It'll just be like weird little, weird little diagrams, yeah. like nerdy <laughs> little boxes and things, right? And then... Um, and I know what each one means, but yeah. nobody else ever would. It's, it's not. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I do have a sort of, I think this is kind of not really true, but I have a sort of supernatural belief in sort of, yeah, well, you know, that is that very famous quote about, it's, it's supposed to be Michelangelo talking about sculpting David. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe he ever said this really, but like that all you're doing is you're removing the, you're not creating the sculpture, you're removing the bits of marble to reveal the sculpture that was always there or something, something like that. And I, I don't, I do not wish to compare my writing to my friend, <laughs> David, please. But, um, but there is some sort of sense that like, there probably is a kind of a, there's a right structure mm -hmm. that is out there. And I'm just sort of trying to uncover it gradually. And that might not be true, but it's helpful as a way of thinking because you sort of think, well, okay, I'll make an outline and then I'll start writing and probably the writing won't stick to the outline. But if that's because the structure needs to be something different I than see. the outline, then fine, you know, because it, it'll be what it needs to be, which, yeah, like I say, I don't think that's really true, but it's a very helpful way to think, I think. At least that's how you think about it right yeah. now. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. speaking about that editing, I think sometimes some people try to write and edit at the same time, which right. for me is, uh, it's, it's really hard to do. But I'm curious, how is for you? Well, the thing that I do, which I think is a bit eccentric, but is really helpful to me, is I, I will write things on the computer, mm -hmm. but then I'll print them out and type them back in from the printout. So wow. I've literally got the piece of paper and I'm, I'm typing it back into the computer from the paper and in that transition I will make all sorts of changes wow. almost subconsciously so instead of looking at a sentence and be like oh that needs to change I'll just it'll come better the second time around somehow because I have this framework so a lot of my writing is retyping that's super cool it's different it's certainly different uh, it, it, it's so useful for me 
If we can switch gears to talk about your last book, The 4,000 Weeks, and I'm sorry if I'm not capturing this well, but one of the main ideas for me was this notion that sometimes we're comparing the time that we have alive with infinite time as we're going to be alive forever. But there is a huge difference comparing the time that I have on this earth with the possibility of not being alive uh, or not being born. And there is this strong sense of gratitude for the time that we have on this earth. How was for you, what's the story behind that book? And how did you cultivate or how do you cultivate this sense of gratitude for the time that we have in this earth? I mean, the story of this book for me, personally speaking, was about sort of spending realizing that I had spent years and years of my adult life trying to find, you know, the perfect productivity technique and the perfect time management technique and and realizing that it was all part of this desire to sort of, yeah, get a kind of control over time or to feel secure about time in a way that I don't think we actually get to do as human beings, right? Because we are always, time will always win the battle in the end. Um, And so on that specific, it's interesting that, I mean, I think that is definitely one of the ideas in the book is that like part of this has one way of expressing that urge to sort of win the battle with time is to kind of cheat death, right? To live forever, Hmm. or if not to literally live forever, then to be so productive with the time you do have that you can do everything which is just a way of being of living forever by another means right if you one way to live forever is to never die and the other one is to be able to do literally everything in your life within your lifespan it sort of amounts to the same thing in a way um and we can't do either of those things um and i think that that's when you see that like there's this strange i mean it's understandable but i think we do generally by default think of life as short and it's kind of an insult that it gets taken away after a number of years which is totally takes for granted the idea that we came here in the first place right you could Mm -hmm. you could just as easily switch what you're comparing to and say well almost every potential person was never born to begin with it's a bit of a strange philosophical Mm -hmm. idea but you know so so actually um that does sort of trigger in me a little bit of a sense of gratitude for this for this time and when I'm feeling very when I'm sort of feeling resentful about the fact that there isn't enough time to do the things I want to do or think I have to do yeah it's very useful one way of expressing it which I do do in the book at one point is like I think the idea of a menu is really interesting because a menu is a kind of a list that we you never expect to get everything from right the whole idea of a menu is you pick one or two things and it's lovely that you have the opportunity to pick them. Mm-hmm. Um, a to-do list is the opposite. It's like, you've got to get to the end of it. Otherwise you're not really justified your existence on the planet. And um, so I do, you know, uh, you could stretch this metaphor too far probably, but I do think there's something very useful about thinking about life, like being like choosing from a restaurant menu, you know, mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm nobody goes to a very fancy restaurant and and feels bad that they can only eat a couple of the dishes from the menu instead you think how wonderful that i had the opportunity to go to this um fancy restaurant and and taste some of the food so i think there is something in that i mean a big question here in terms of how i make myself cause myself to feel grateful and things like, and it it's yeah. relevant to the acceptance and commitment therapy and all the stuff that i know you've been thinking about Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, I will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. And if you are feeling extra generous, I welcome a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes of this episode are in the website playingitsafe.com. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable playing it safe actions. See you soon!